Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our, what month is this, uh, April meeting of the Academic Council. Uh, thank you for joining and attending the meeting today. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to say that I hope everyone has had their vaccine or, or on the list to get it. Uh, so I encourage you all to take advantage of the opportunity to get vaccinated. Uh, it's easy as pie. Uh, so Duke is running a very smooth operation. So, so please do uh, get your vaccinations. Uh, a few announcements before we get to our agenda. Uh, this spring, our normal process for awarding the Faculty Scholars Award resumed. Uh, as you might recall, uh, last year, our process was interrupted because of the pandemic. Undergraduates in their third year are eligible to be for consideration for this award, which is the only faculty endowed award at Duke. The award was established by some of our faculty colleagues in 1974. This year, 28 nominations were received from various departments. The Council's Faculty Scholars Award Committee reviewed all of the nominations and selected nine finalists for interviews. From these nine, three were selected to receive the award. And I'm pleased today to share the names of the Faculty Scholar Award winners from the class of 2022. And they are Catherine Gann, a Global Gender Studies major, Logan Glastetter, a chemistry major, and Zin Yu Tan, a computer science and mathematics major. All three intend to pursue a PhD in their respective fields of study. So please join me in congratulating these students and extending best wishes for their future academic endeavors. And let me also thank our colleagues who served on the selection committee. Uh, they did double duty this year, again, because of the interruptions we had last year with the uh, pandemic. So thank you, committee. Now I want to say a word about uh, the earned degree approvals that will take place at our May 6th meeting. Each year, the Academic Council has the high honor and the distinct responsibility of approving the earned degrees of all students seeking, seeking to graduate uh, from Duke. The council will do this again this year at our May 6th meeting. If you have been reading your emails and do today carefully, you will know the university will be holding a commencement ceremony on Sunday, May the 2nd. Now, even in this crazy world of the pandemic, two still comes before six. So the candidates for earned degrees will commence with pomp and circumstance on May the 2nd. But on May 6th, the council will receive the names of the candidates for the degrees from the deans of our 10 schools and we'll approve those degrees uh, at that meeting. And I know we'll approve them because I get to count the votes. Uh, so we're a little off schedule uh, this year because of the pandemic and moving commencement up earlier in the, uh, in the month. Uh, so students will commence on the second. We will uh, receive and approve the candidates for a degree at our May 6th academic council meeting and the degrees will be conferred and the candidates will graduate on, on or shortly after May 7th, assuming the Board of Trustees uh, will approve and accept our approvals. I don't count those votes, so I can't <laughs> guarantee that, uh, but I assume they will uh, approve our recommendations. So like always, no candidate for a degree would be awarded a degree before the faculty approves it. So please attend the May 6th meeting so that we can undertake our most important uh, responsibility as faculty. Uh, my last announcement uh, is about the election of ECAC members. Uh, as you know, the election is underway. Uh, those eligible to vote are council members for the next academic year, 2021-2022. So if your term ends in May, uh, you should not have received uh, a ballot for the election. Standing for the election, for the three openings are Betty Tong from Clinical Sciences and the School of Medicine, Warren Grill from the Pratt School of Engineering, Scott Hotel, Psychology and Neuroscience in the Social Sciences Division, Theo Porter Young from the Divinity School, Sam Buell from the Law School, and Keisha Cutright from the Fuqua School of Business. ECAC is grateful that these six colleagues agreed to stand for election and that they are committed to putting the time disposition requires should they be uh, elected. I will announce the results of the election at the May 6th meeting. Next, we'll move to the approval 
of the minutes from the March 18th meeting. Uh, the minutes, as usual, were posted on our website. Are there any corrections or edits to the minutes? Hearing or seeing none, uh, the minutes are approved. Now we'll move to uh, our agenda. And our first presentation is from Cheryl Broberman, my colleague from ECAT and a faculty member from Biology and Global Health. And Cheryl served, at the, served as, a, as chair of the committee to examine the various faculty titles used throughout the university for non-tenure track regular rank faculty. Some of you may recall that in October 2016, uh, Professor Judith Kelly of the Sanford School and Dr. Kevin Moore, Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs in Trinity College, presented to this council some proposed revisions to the faculty handbook concerning regular rank non tenure track faculty. Those proposals dealt exclusively with the process and procedures for reviewing and reappointing non tenure track regular rank faculty. What it did not do was address the issue of the variation and how non tenure track regular rank faculty titles are used across the university. After several discussions with ECAT, I appointed a committee uh, to examine this issue. Uh, a draft report from the committee's work over the past 18 or so months uh, was posted with your agenda. Cheryl will now talk more about their findings and answer any questions you may have. But before giving the floor to Cheryl, let me say a few words about what will happen with this report. Mm -hmm. I've spoken with Provost Cornblue to whom this report would be transmitted after we get feedback from you. The plan is for Sally to discuss the report with the deans and put it on an, an academic programs committee agenda sometime next academic year. After the APC discussion, the report will come back to ECAT, perhaps with some amendments and additional recommendations. Uh, ECAT would then decide whether to bring it back to academic council with any specific proposals that council should vote on. So today's presentation and discussion is limited to the matter of the variation and how these faculty titles are used across the university. Cheryl. Thank you, Carrie. Happy to be here. And I was really delighted to work on this project with some wonderful faculty from across campus. If you look at uh, who participated in this, we have Kathy Bradley representing law, um, Beth Hauser, who's from Biostats and Bioinformatics in the Medical Center, uh, Joe from Pratt, and then we have Mark Anthony, Ranji, and Victoria um, providing some good distribution across Trinity, and then Ken Rogerston in Sanford. So a really stellar group to talk about um, our charge, which is on this slide. So we were given the specific charge to assess how the titles of professor of the practice, research professor, lecturer, and senior lecturer are currently used by schools and departments and institutes across the university. And I think it's important to note this excludes the schools of medicine and nursing, which have a very different faculty structure and have their own processes. Um, in order to ascertain if there was consistency in the classifications with regard to teaching, research, and service expectations. Excuse me. Um, in addition, the committee was asked to assess what distinguishes or should distinguish each of these ranks from the other, determine if new regular rank non tenure track designations are warranted, or whether we should consolidate existing designations, particularly given the context of higher education in general and Duke in particular, and define pathways for promotion in each rank and suggest recommendations for what those pathways should be and recommend procedures for evaluation of regular rank non tenure track faculty that will help ensure consistency in evaluations across units and departments. So in sum, the committee was charged to look for consistency within a title, clarity between the titles, and some equity in those definitions across campus. As Carrie said, we had a very specific charge. We were not charged to examine the number of regular rank non tenure track faculty on campus, or the philosophy of the inclusion of these faculty within the academy, all worth discussing, um, but not within this committee. So here was our process. Uh, we started out about getting a sense of the landscape on campus. We looked at the bylaws from 17 departments in Trinity College representing all three divisions. 
We looked at the five different schools, again, not nursing or the School of Medicine, but Fuqua, Law, Sanford, Pratt, and Nicholas. And for comparison, we looked at eight peer schools to see how they framed their bylaws to deal with uh, regular ranked on tenure track faculty. What we found looking at Duke is that regular rank non-tenure track faculty are critical members of the professoriate at Duke. They're deeply integrated into every school and division. There are some parts of the university that cannot function without them, the program in ed, international comparative studies, and the institutes and centers only hire regular rank non-tenure track faculty. This is data provided by David Jamison Drake's office, looking at the percentage across campus. Note here that the institutes and centers are 100% um, non-tenure track faculty. And Trinity is about 28% compared to that 100%. Um, in the schools where you might imagine bringing in more non-academic professionals or people in non-academic careers, uh, you see the law school up at 41% and particularly Sanford at almost 50%, excuse me, 50% uh, non-regular rank. Uh, again, perhaps looking at bringing in non-academic professionals to enrich their programs. Duke is different from all of the peer schools we analyzed except Harvard. Um, Stanford, Brown, Penn, and Cornell had only short-term visiting non-academic professionals, those without a terminal degree in academia. They were expected to continue their professional work outside of academia while affiliated and expected to return to non-academic work when the affiliation ended. So not considered people as permanent parts of the academy. Princeton only used a lecturer and instructor for educating, uh, educators teaching faculty. Hopkins only pops in the business school, again, bringing in people for, from their professional lives. University of Chicago pops in the law school. And Harvard was the one that was most similar to Duke. Um, I'm not gonna say Duke was similar to Harvard. Harvard was more similar to Duke in bringing in nationally recognized national and international scholars with terminal degrees in academia that were expected to have leadership on campus and in governance and maintain a long-term affiliation with the university. So if you look at the gender distribution um, on campus, you find that um, regular rank non-tenure track faculty are highly um, female using uh, traditional gender binary compared to 30% across campus. And that actually does include the med school and the nursing school um, for women. Nicholas Law and Trinity are much more heavily, have women much more heavily represented. Um, there could be some interesting discussions about uh, spousal hiring over time, the different ways women get brought onto campus um, worth perhaps a, dig a deeper dive later on. And I pulled some data. I was also on the faculty compensation committee two years ago and looking at salary equity. Um, and the biggest, some of the biggest inequities on campus were in the non-tenure track divisions. Um, overall, tenure track faculty are above 90% gender equity ratio, often most of them near 100. Um, and the report concluded that uh, the POPs, they did not look at research professors or lecturers in that data analysis but that POPs were one of the places that had the highest gender inequity, despite the fact having the greatest number of women in that designation. So we really found that faculty with the same title and rank can have very different job descriptions and evaluation criteria for promotion. Some of our major findings, there was a wide range, particularly for research professors and POPs with little consistency or clarity within each designation. Many units had job descriptions for research professors and POPs that were identical despite the different titles. Many units had job expectations for POPs that differed little from tenure track faculty expectations. Um, and the non-tenure track faculty in the natural sciences are often expected to do nationally or internationally recognized research without being provided access to laboratories, startup funds, or graduate students. And honestly, the word practice had very little meaning on campus right now, given the wide range of people that hold that title, ranging from artists to chemists to social scientists. So if I walk you through some of the findings, starting with research professors, each line in this chart is from a different bylaw, from a different unit on campus. And you can see, starting out with research, some research professors are expected to do only independent research, be fully funded by external grants, 
Others are expected to work in the laboratory of a tenure track faculty member. Some are expected to have publication records comparable to that of tenure track. Others are supposed to include teaching, administrative work, or have teaching loads equivalent to tenure track faculty. Some are expected to do no teaching. The, uh, we got the data on uh, origins of salary and it ranged from 100% salaried from Duke to 100% external funding. So very little clarity or consistency on what a research professor should be doing at Duke. Same thing for looking at the POPs, starting out looking at research. Many people think of props as teaching faculty. Um, some bylaws said some research, others said nationally peer-reviewed, sorry, peer-reviewed national and internationally recognized scholarship, innovation that leads to recognition at the national level. Again, POPs are very diverse. Some were expected to have performance experience, but not scholarship. Um, some were expected to continue their professional lives outside of academia for recognizing that type of POP. Um, and going down to teaching, it could be just saying teaching to teaching load equal to tenure track to teaching load higher to tenure track. So again, very different expectations as far as recent research and teaching and little clarity amongst the definitions of POPs across campus. For lecturer, um, a little bit tighter, less quite spread, but I would have thought a lecturer on campus strictly taught was involved in the pedagogical mission. But again, they went from no research to some research to teaching and research to teaching and advising to fundraising. So again, um, a lecturer is not a lecturer is not a lecturer across campus. So we had a series of recommendations that came out of doing this analysis. The first is to recognize that lecturers are part of the professoriate and deserve to be recognized with the teaching professor title. And uh, that would be used for those with the primary expectation is teaching. And we thought we should restrict the research professor to faculty whose primary expectation is independent scholarship, functioning as independent researchers compared to working in the laboratory assisting tenure track faculty and the title research scientist should be used for that. So these would create two parallel tracks or two parallel, excuse me, faculty designations, um, clearly defined one with primary research, one primary teaching. Uh, the POPs were a little harder because of the complexity of how they have been brought in, their expectations across campus and the nature of the practice. We spent quite a bit of time on this and decided for clarity that we proposed three different titles for POPs. The first being Professor of the Arts, um, recognizing and highlighting the value of the arts on campus and elevating this position. Um, professor of the Practice should perhaps be restricted or used predominantly for those who are professional lives outside of academia, for example, a World Bank economist who might come and affiliate with the university, perhaps for a long time, but their training is, a, is as a non-academic. Um, and use career track, which is modeled over what happened in the medical school with their analysis of titles to um, for academically based, academically structured POPs, people with PhDs, who come here to do research, scholarship, and teaching, and they would be assistant, associate, or full without tenure. Again, modeling the titles in the Med Center. We also think it's important to clearly delineate how POPs differ from tenure track, given that they are expected to perform in all three areas. Um, we accept it as a given, though this could perhaps be revisited, that POPs should demonstrate teaching excellence. But we recommended that promotion to full um, should use some examples currently used on campus in saying that you need national recognition and scholarship or service to the field. Um, so uh, someone who was in their disciplinary societies and helping develop new curricula on diversity, um, you know, DEI curricula that is nationally recognized might be worthy of promotion as much as their traditional academic scholarship. We also recommend some kind of process for this for oversight of the weighting of scholarship teaching and service um, within each unit um, to really promote fairness. Um, Trinity naturally has a structure that leads itself to this in that while the chairs and departments create the different expectations, the divisional deans can look for equity across those departments and across their divisions. In Pratt, 
Um, multiple departments could be creating um, definitions and expectations and weighting of scholarship teaching and service. Um, there's only a single person, but the dean could be responsible for that equity. And unfortunately, in the Institute, Sanford and Nicholas, there's not an obvious, excuse me, an obvious oversight structure um, for ensuring that there is equity in how these titles are applied and evaluated. Um, it was felt pretty strongly by the committee from um, that in rare but appropriate cases to allow non tenure track faculty to convert their position to tenure track or tenured in a no risk manner. That is not lose their pop or research professor category if they were denied that tenure. Um, it was acknowledged by some in some departments that some of the most high profile or most productive faculty were pops or research professors and that in appropriate cases this we can we create a pathway for that um, transition to recognize what they're currently contributing to duke number seven is to regularize the contract lengths and provide longer contracts for faculty with a track record of excellence right now three four five and ten year contracts are used for different people there are people who've been on campus for 20 years that are still doing four year contracts, which means every three years they have to put together an evaluation committee and put a proposal. And we find that is not perhaps the best use of departmental and faculty time when people have established track records of excellence. This is slightly outside the purview of this committee, but it came up multiple times and we felt we should share it um, to recognize that the MFA is the terminal degree in the arts equivalent to an MD or a JD and to consider allowing faculty in that in those positions to apply for tenure track positions at Duke. We hope that leads to a rich conversation about how Duke retains some of the most excellent artists in the country. And finally, since many non tenure track faculty are judged on nationally on having and producing nationally and internationally recognized scholarship that they should have access to academic leave in order to advance it. Currently, Trinity offers a dean's leave policy that has varied widely under different deans from 50% of applicants being approved to almost none. Um, it is not guaranteed like sabbatical. It is something that is competitively applied for, but faculty in other units on campus, um, the, the non-tenure track faculty in the institutes are not eligible for any form of leave even though they are assessed to evaluation and promotion on their scholarship. So quite a wide range of recommendations. Um, we did find that regular rank non tenure track faculty are critical members of the professoriate at Duke. They're deeply integrated. They are critical um, for many units on campus for the strategic growth of teaching and research. And we hope this report stimulates conversation that leads to greater equity for our colleagues. I will stop then and take any questions. Thank you, Cheryl, uh, for that uh, very comprehensive report. I want to thank the committee for all the hard work it put in. Uh, any questions for Cheryl and the committee? I don't know if Carrie, you're going to call or me, Carrie. Uh, Carrie can call on Carrie. Okay. <laughs> Carrie Markwood. Thanks. Um, Cheryl, thank you and your committee for this really important um, con contribution and, and a great job. I have two, um, I think, practical questions. One is the the recommendation for um, pops having, pardon the bird sounds, um, national um, a national reputation in two areas. One of which would be teaching. It's not clear to me what a national reputation and teaching would consist of that wouldn't be scholarship of teaching and learning or other things that would fall under service um, or scholarship. Um, Sorry, second question. Just, okay, yeah, I'll pause, go ahead. Um, that was lack of clarity on my part. Maybe it's a little clearer in the report. Um, one of the two of being research or service. We expect good teaching as evaluated internally by you and then national recognition in either research or service to the field. Okay, so my I, right, I read the report and the report 
mentions national recognition in two areas. And my point is, there's a difference between excellence in teaching and national recognition of excellence in teaching. And it's the latter that I have a hard time understanding what, what a portfolio would have that would demonstrate that. Right. We weren't asking for that. The teaching would be an internal evaluation for the quality of teaching. And then you would have national, oh, sorry, excuse me, you're right. We need to change the title. In, you need to have national recognition in research or service on top of the teaching. You're absolutely right. We need to modify that language in charge for lack of clarity. It okay. was you had to do research or service on top of your teaching. Right. The intent okay. of the recommendation. Right. The, the second is the the option to convert from POP to a tenure line. Um, I'm assuming that POPs who would have the portfolio to do that would probably not be assistant POPs. So what happens, for instance, to an associate or a full POP? Do they then become assistant POPs? Because I'd imagine they wouldn't convert to a full, I mean, to a to assistant prof. Um, so how, how does the rank thing work? Yeah, we did not operationalize that. That obviously would require more work and with the provost's office. Um, this was looking at people who are currently full POPs and the assumption that they would transfer to tenure, not tenure track. And the question would be whether that would be associate or full is something um, that would have to be operationalized. Is this a, is there, is it a drop down a rank? Is it a one-to-one -one transfer across? Right, um, okay. It's a great question that really needs a little more time to dig in with the provost's office and how to operationalize. Thank you. David Malone, did you have your hand up? I guess not. Cheryl, you see anyone else? That... Uh, do, 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 do. Any other questions? There, there is a hand up. Jana has a, her hand up. OK, Jana. Thank you, and, and thanks for the great presentation and all your hard work. Um, this is a follow-up question on Carrie's great questions. Um, and your, your answer might be that it was not part of your purview, so you don't know how to answer it. But um, some of the institutes have world-renowned uh, research professors and POPs who only have the, only one appointment, and it is in those institutes. Right. And so I was curious if you guys had thought about what a move to tenure track might look like for uh, POPs and research professors in the institutes. Yeah, obviously the only uh, people who can grant tenure right now are departments. So that faculty member would have to have develop an affiliation with an department um, unless there is a policy change to allow tenure to be given within institutes and centers, which currently I believe is not the case. So we, are, we do recognize the work done in the institutes and centers and the challenges those faculty face in not having access to resources through Trinity, even though they might be teaching heavily in the undergraduate curriculum, um, that would have to be an affiliation with a department, which then brings up what is the department get for that line. So it is a, a trickier conversation. Thanks. David Malone. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. I want to thank the provost and Cheryl and the committee for all their work on this. Um, I'm in my 35th year here at Duke as a pop, and there, there has been a long-standing need for clarity to be brought to the expectations and responsibilities and the career pathways of pop. So uh, thanks to Sally and Cheryl for giving attention to this. Carrie started the committee. I think he's going to yell at me if I don't give him credit. So uh, <laughs> but thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, David. Any other questions for Cheryl or the committee? And again, thank you, Cheryl. The, the process will be that this will be a discussion with, uh, continuing discussion with uh, Provost Corn Blue, uh, and she will then discuss with the deans and APC. Sally, you want to say anything at this, at this time? No, I think that's great. I think it was a really. We lost you, Sally. You're muted. Sorry, uh, I only do that five times a day. Um, 
Uh, so I think it was a really excellent report. So Cheryl, thanks to the work of, of uh, you know, your work and the work of the committee. Uh, I think the process will be good. I will make one comment about this conversion from um, uh, non-tenure track to tenure track. Uh, just looking historically, it's not unprecedented at Duke, but the, 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 the instances that I'm aware of, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, at least it's most frequent, uh, in that rarity that it's been a full to a full conversion. In other words, looking over, uh, you know, the career of the individual, they've clearly done that their career clearly merits tenure at full. That doesn't preclude though us looking at the other options that you mentioned, Cheryl. So I think this should be part of the discussion uh, with the deans um, and with uh, APC. Um, I will say that, um, that I still think it's gonna be a somewhat rare event. In other words, it's not, uh, it's not that we will routinely bring people people in, you know, on non tenure track and then funnel into tenure track. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that, including, you know, the clock and what's expected for progression. Uh, again, that's quite different from medicine, where uh, there are tracks that are a little bit less that they can come in less differentiated and move to tenure. But obviously, the options for sort of clinical practice, et cetera, are different from uh, on the campus side. So. It'll require more discussion, but I think there's a core of some really good uh, recommendations in the report. Oh, thanks, Sally. And I want to highlight something that Cheryl highlighted in the report, and that's this issue of equity. Uh, and that's important that we, I think, pay attention to how titles are used with regards to equity. Uh, so thank you, Cheryl, and the committee for uh, quite an excellent report. Uh, our next agenda item is a proposal for a new executive master's degree uh, in the Sanford School of Public Policy. Uh, Dean Judith Kelly and her colleagues will outline uh, their rationale and plan for this proposed degree and, and take questions. Uh, the various supporting materials uh, were posted on our Sakai site along with the agenda. Uh, and you should note that this proposal has gone through our regular uh, committee structure uh, for consideration. Uh, as per our bylaws, we will vote on the proposal uh, at our May 6th meeting. Uh, should you have questions between now and then, please send them to me via our academic council email address. And I will take those and, and give those to Dean Kelly and we'll get answers either before the meeting or at the meeting on May 6th. Dean Kelly. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, and uh, if I may, I would love to just have a chance for my uh, 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 the people who are accompanying me to present the proposal to quickly introduce themselves. Would that be okay, Carrie? Sure. Okay, Mark, if you would just introduce yourself briefly. Sure. My name is Mark Hart, and uh, I'm the. I call myself the, the new still. I think it's a year, um, but uh, the director of digital learning at, at the Sanford School. So thank you. And Mark comes to us from a position at Florida. Uh, university where he was the director of an extensive suite of online programs that, that he built. So we're really appreciative of his experience. Tim, would you introduce yourself, please? Yes, thank you, Judith. Uh, hello, colleagues. My name is Tim Nichols. I uh, teach counterterrorism policy uh, and policy analysis in the Sanford School. I've been there, I, I've been in at Duke for 14 years. And I also run a number of executive programs, not only short-term executive education programs uh, dealing with the military and the national security apparatus, but a year-long program uh, through which we bring national security professionals to, to uh, be at Duke for a year and award. We don't award them a degree, but just a certificate and acknowledge uh, their professional development and then send them back to their respective agencies. So uh, very excited to have the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much. Um, and do I have uh, privileges to share uh, our PowerPoint? Yes, I think so. Perfect, perfect. I'll talk just a little bit and then I'll start sharing it and see if I can, if, if I can figure out how to do that uh, at the same time as, as, as talk. Um, so um, it, uh, first of all, I'm gonna thank the Academic Council for all the important work that you do. Um, you know, you're sort of the backbone of our university and it's, it's not a lot of folks who appreciate just how much work goes into being part of the council. Uh, and our uh, proposal that we 
uh, sent to you today is display number one on that because it's very, very extensive uh, reading material. And so I appreciate the time that you put into uh, to orienting yourself uh, on, on that proposal and for helping us um, uh, make it as, as good as we can. Uh, this proposal you have for, uh, before you now is the result of a, a three-year process really that started with our strategic priorities planning uh, where we said one of our strategic goals to be broadening our professional offerings. At that point, we created a academic programs task force that was headed by Bruce Gentleson. And we set three criteria at that time for how we would broaden our professional programs, like what the criteria would be for whether a new idea would have legs for us. Um, and those three criteria were that it had to be mission enhancing. Uh, that we have to have the capacity to be excellent when we launch such a program, and it had to be revenue positive. Those were the three criteria. And based on those three criteria, a number of recommendations came out from the Academic Programs Task Force. And one of them was the creation of a hybrid mid-career program. But we didn't want to replicate and compete with what so many other leading schools are doing in this space. We thought we would be better off finding a niche where we could start out in something that we thought would be really our strength and we could differentiate ourselves from uh, the market. And that's what, we, what led to our focus on a national security program. Uh, and I wanna make clear that we are defining national security uh, as it intersects with so many important issues today, climate, health, cyber, international development, and so forth. So, you know, this is a, a broad program, the aim of which is uh, to take folks who've had a rather narrow experience working in national security and broaden their perspective on all the policy uh, implications and, and uh, 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 edges that, that are to uh, the national security field. Uh, so the focus and the plan curriculum that we are uh, proposing has been also shaped by extensive consultation, not just with faculty, but with private and public sector national security experts. We've had many uh, interviews and consultations with them, local and regional uh, military personnel as well, and our own extensive um, uh, alums that we have and students that we've had uh, at Sanford, both in our uh, concentration that we have in our existing program, as well as this uh, counter security, uh, uh, counter terrorism fellows program we've had for a long time and the executive education cohorts we've had. Uh, so now I wanna, uh, I wanna turn it over to Tim um, after I figure out how to share our slides here. Um, and, and then Tim will, um, We'll talk a little bit about why we think uh, this program has the, um, the capacity to really be excellent for us. So I'm gonna try to play this here. There we go. Go ahead, Tim. Okay, thank you. Um, it just is a quick snapshot of, of what we're looking at. You can see uh, that we're, we are being selective. Judith meant, uh, mentioned that we're gonna be broad, but it's gonna be broad within national security. So we're going to ask for a slightly more experienced cohort. Some of the programs we have, uh, you can go from undergraduate right into it. And we're really trying to dissuade people from this because our baseline is going to be a little bit more sophisticated. We're asking for people who have worked in the national security area from, for seven to 10 years, there is a broad acceptance of, you know, NGOs who are helping uh, people who are working in, in biotechnology, as long as it relates to national security issues, we're willing to um, consider them. You can see that we're offering two options, and this is based on numerous consultations uh, in and outside of Sanford. One is what I would consider the, the, the 12 month rigorous program that will most definitely leave a mark uh, on the people who undergo it. And the second one is 20 month, which will be the same content just stretched over a longer period of time for those who know going in that they will not be able to um, keep up with the rigor of the 12 month program. And then our cost for either is 45K. Uh, the, the quantity of educational components is the same, but we've developed in such a way that uh, those who might not be able to uh, keep up with the 12 month can go to the 20 month program. Uh, next slide, please, Judith. 
I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm not. I'm not successful at this. It's okay. The problem is that um, once I go out to a view where I can see my own screen, then it takes it back to the first slide. So <laughs> okay. uh, I'm very sorry about this, folks. Clearly, uh, this is why most of these things are not normally left to me. Um, so. So I can talk about this one as well, Judith, and then I think you, maybe you could address the next one. Okay. Uh, it, it, one of the things that we want to do, and, and we've had numerous conversations, is try to figure out a competitive advantage. And we have a number that we think we've teased out. The first one is our master's degree is less expensive than a two-year MPP in residence at, in Durham, and it's less expensive than a two- or three-year program elsewhere. So the price point is attractive. We're going to keep the first cohort small and make it scalable. So we think that we'll keep it small for the first few years just to make sure that the admission standards are kept at a very high level, uh, that we have the feel of a Duke University education. We're not trying to make a factory or a mill here. And then we have uh, some pretty tremendous staff members and faculty members within the Sanford School that can manage and help this program at its beginning. We're not planning on bringing a huge amount of extra folks on board to help us. The final piece is right now our target audience is six hours driving distance from Durham. Why? Because throughout the academic year there are going to be moments of immersion, three-day periods during the semester and five-day periods during the summer where we're gonna ask the cohort to come to Duke and we're gonna take them all day long, have networking events, have classes, have uh, orientation, have all sorts of activities so that there's a personal feel to it. We definitely don't want to be seen as an online course. So we want to definitely build relationships by having in-person events. In order to do that, we have to have a feasible trans, uh, commuting distance and right now with the pandemic and folks being um, uncomfortable with uh, plane travel, we think that we can target our cohort within six hours. That doesn't mean it's exclusively, but that covers Washington DC, that covers the 660,000 US military service members who are stationed within a six hour distance of Duke and rotate every three years. And it covers the number of cons the consulting and government employees in the DC and uh, Maryland area. So that's why we think uh, we can appeal to an audience to come to Duke and to get uh, an executive master's, or I should say to attend Duke, to come to Duke occasionally and get an executive master. Over to you, Judith. I don't know if we want to keep, there we go. Uh, so um, it's, it's very important for us to ensure uh, that we have uh, an excellent program. We don't want to just uh, create sort of a run of the mill program. That's why we're keeping it a certain size. And we're planning to do this uh, by building on, we have already a very strong uh, national security faculty at, at, at uh, Sanford and, uh, and there's some at, at other places as well across the university who also had input into the creation of this program. Um, but we really want to try to uh, diversify this faculty by bringing practice faculty to it as well, because we want it to be a very strong professional program. And we envision a model where the program is led by the practice faculty, uh, but where we have rotations, uh, exchanges with the tenure uh, line faculty into the program. And given that it's a hybrid program, there are lots of ways we can do this, not just people owning certain courses, but making sure that when we're doing a, a lecture on the topic that uh, Peter Fever is a, uh, expert on or Bruce Shendelson is an expert on, those folks can, can come in and help with that. But also that when we have these weekend experiences or on-campus experiences, that we can, we can integrate some of our uh, master students who are here on campus and some of the faculty who are here on campus. And in that way, we really think that this is not going to be some siloed program where there's a, a special faculty that's hired just to do that. It really needs to be a Duke experience. And that's, uh, that's very important for us. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to, to really bring more diversity, uh, both in the types of experiences we have, 
um, but also the types of uh, demographics we have in our faculty. And we think that's really important. And finally, we also have very good connections, uh, not just Sanford, but Duke as a whole to the national security community. Uh, and so we think that there are experts that we can bring in uh, uh, even if they're not part of our faculty, we can bring into our classes that really would take it up to uh, an outstanding level for our students to have that level of, of interactions. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark, if you will talk a little bit about recruiting and um, admissions. Sure. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, some, something that we're, we're cognizant about is building these cohorts and having uh, really high standards for that. Um, you know, I think we, we feel like there's a, a really a need for this uh, within this regional area and beyond. Um, you know, so uh, obviously we want to do things on a, a kind of on a standardized way that, that Duke does, you know, so we're going to be using the, the general admission systems. Uh, and really, we, we've already been working. I mean, we don't want to ever put the cart in front of the horse, you know, but, um, you know, with the timeline, we've been working uh, in Sanford. We have a, a really great uh, communications uh, team and we just hired a new marketing specialist who has some time carved out uh, for this. Uh, so, so we've been working on a, a lot of ideas on how we can kind of mix traditional, um, you know, obviously uh, online, social media, uh, and, and progressive ways uh, to really market uh, this program. You know, so anytime you have a new program, you know, I think obviously one of the first things you have to do is, is, is get the word out. Uh, and of course, I think Duke's uh, reputation and Sanford's reputation and, and Tim and his group, you know, their reputation will, will do a lot of work uh, for us in that regard. Uh, so, you know, so we're looking at traditional ways of marketing, uh, you know, obviously a whole infrastructure, you know, with our, with our website and our social media presence, um, you know, obviously going into analytics and Google uh, and such. But, you know, th that's all in ways and that we need to, to utilize to, to get the word out and, you know, get the particulars across and the logistics and make people, you know, aware, uh, you know, obviously that, that we exist and what's what's special about our program, uh, you know, for ourselves and in relation to competitors, you know, but, but beyond that, I think just like with everything else that we do at Sanford, um, you know, that's just kind of the way you get your foot in the door to, to talk to people. And once that occurs, you know, then we really, um, Kind of switch gears to a very personal approach. You know, I think with an executive program, um, you know, I think it's really important that you know, as these people are working and have jobs, that you you really have to to show them how this fits in with their life uh, and with their goals. Uh, and we're going to really work with every single person individually, you know, through phone calls and emails and and hopefully campus visits down the road uh, to to really uh, you know show them how this is gonna fit with them and, and they're moving forward. And, you know, I think one of the things, um, you know, I know everybody likes a, a marketing plan and uh, all this market research, you know, but I, I think I go back to what you just said, uh, you know, I know I know Tim's a, a pretty humble guy, you know, but I, I think there's been a, a real desire for something like this in the area. And I think, you know, a lot of people have approached him and another faculty we have, you know, when are you guys going to do something like this? You know, and I think, um, you know, Tim has a really also um, a detailed plan, you know, as, as we've talked about this, it's kind of like a regional approach of uh, getting out there on these bases and getting out there with these organizations, um, you know, and I think that there's going to be a really high demand once the, the switch is turned on. Um, but, you know, we're not just going to just lean on that, you know, so we're also going to get out there and, and really work to have a recruiting kind of mindset, you know, that we want to, to help people, of course, they want to join us, but we also want to get, get the right people and get a diverse group uh, in here as well. And, and also, you know, I think part of that is, is we're talking about organizations or military bases, but it, it would be great too, if we could start to create some kind of long-term uh, connections with these groups and then you know maybe some of these organizations can send you know a few people to us uh year over year and then that that will allow us uh, even with our our work our curriculum our projects to start creating some some long-standing things that we can do with these organizations thanks so much mark um tim is going to talk a little bit about the curriculum and then we're going to mark is going to uh, talk about the online pedagogy that we're going to be adopting and then i'll close it out and we'll open it up for questions so you know what we've got left so tim over to you. Thank you. Okay, um, so we spent significant time uh, querying what topic should be covered in an executive master's of national security. We had the Duke faculty perspective. 
I queried the military, I queried the consulting world, and there were some general themes that came out and we feel like we've, uh, we've captured those. We had to decide how much latitude we wanted to give the students and the answer was, there's too many basic things that we need to uh, shore up to give them a lot of latitude. It's an executive program focused on sharpening at the understanding of the uh, US national security process and how strategy uh, is affected. So you can see here the, the courses, budgeting, ethics, leadership, strategic design, all of those apply across the board to the applicants that you uh, mentioned earlier. We're going to give them one, uh, one extra, uh, I'm sorry, one uh, option, I can't think of the right, one elective, sorry, one elective uh, within a 10 course master's degree to be taken in the spring. And that's, that, the idea behind that is to give them a chance to uh, step out and maybe highlight a Duke faculty member that, that they've been watching or reading about and take a course. Now, the, the key will be that those electives, we have plenty in, Sanf in Sanford, but that elective will, be have, it will have to be something that they can either attend remotely, take online, take remotely in the evening, or else they'll have to fall back to a number of the online courses that we've built um, in Sanford. But nine of the courses are, are pre-programmed and they will be taught in a hybrid format, meaning they'll have some flipped classroom uh, each week, some interaction with the professors uh, each week, and then some immersion. So the idea is to give them the uh, hybrid aspect, all three of those exposures. We have two team-based learning courses, one in the fall and one in the spring, where they'll have projects. And uh, right now we're developing a way to reach out to their employers, whether it's the government or the consulting industry, and try to have some kind of client relationship uh, where the students can take on something that's important to their employers. And, you know, not, don't think of it as a consulting project where we would be billing hours. Think of it more of as an exposure to a real world national security issue that the government or the uh, government contracting world is looking at uh, rigorously. And then the last part I mentioned is we uh, we wanted to look at accreditation and make sure that the the hours and the equivalence of time is being appropriate. Uh, it, it supports the accreditation pathway, and we're we're over in terms of the number of hours spent per class with the immersion experience, with the weekly uh, online classes, and with the flipped classroom, the pre-recorded uh, fifteen to twenty minute lectures that will uh, form the foundation. Of the uh, of the classes, so we think we have, we think we've thought through this. We vetted it uh, with the industry, and we vetted it with the Duke academic uh, folks. So we think we have a pretty good uh, way forward. Over to you, Judith. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Mark. Sure. So I mean, any any new program, you know, sometimes has a ramp up, but I, you know, I think for a lot of reasons, and with our infrastructure, uh, we just built a new recording studio in house. And so much, um, you know, practice that our, our great faculty's got this past year with COVID. And I think we're going to really be able to hit the ground running, you know, with an exceptional product from an online standpoint. Um, you know, we're going to have a very, um, you know, my, my degree is, is from education, educational um, technology, curriculum instruction. So it's going to be really grounded in, in educational theory, including the the new potential educational theory, which is connectivism, which is where we, we really want to connect our students with, with experts in the field. And even though some of this is online, that we want to allow our students to um, uh, be able to, oh, hold on a second. My, I can't see my screen now. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I can go ahead. So that um, you know, we want to can allow them even to be able to uh, to you know network even within a kind of a hybrid program. We're going to use curriculum mapping. So for each, what it's not going to be ten individual courses. You know, what we really want to do is think thematically, and, you know, and how the ten courses are puzzle pieces and work together, and how we can work towards kind of bigger projects that will thread. And then, as Tim talked about, these two courses that will connect with people's professional practice. Again, a blend of synchronous and asynchronous um, materials. You know, so students have the ability, and a lot of students have talked about how they like. Um, you know, being able to watch videos and such before come, coming to class and allows them to be more prepared, but also 
you know, as online learning goes, you know, people do like the advantage sometimes to be able to do things at, at their time and their pace uh, as well. Uh, we've created, a, as I said, a professional grade recording studio inside Sanford. Uh, and we, on the screen here, um, you know, we actually even uh, built a light board, uh, even from just going to Home Depot and, and getting a product. But, uh, you know, what we've built since then is even, even further. Um, one of the things I think that's been talked about, you know, you have one course, you know, the traditional way is having one instructor, but what we're really looking is, is taking each course and breaking it down into modules and who's the best person to teach that module. So this is another way that we can kind of weave in our faculty uh, together and give them more exposure uh, and more collaboration. Um, yeah, we're also not going to shy away from uh, the students doing collaborative work as well, you know, with Zoom and, and so many other tools. Uh, you know, it used to be that online learning was something that was more kind of individual based or just you know, interfacing with the instructor. You know, so we want to do as much as we can to, to have these students work with one another uh, and to really kind of apply the material. Um, we're also really cognizant of you know, one of the things that online learning misses sometimes is just that informal learning, you know, people talking before class or after class uh, are getting together. So we really need to find ways that we can build online learning communities for these students uh, and just ways outside of the classroom for them to interact and, and to process and, and to network or, you know, even just talk about a movie that they saw, uh, you know, so we want to find ways that we can do that uh, as well. And I think Tim also did a really good job of describing how this curriculum has been vetted in a way where uh, it not only is it foundations that people need, it's skill building, but you know every cohort that goes through it, it's going to be different because we've also created it, uh, the topics to where they're malleable to real world events. Uh, and then everything will be different for each student within the cohort because then they are in turn connecting it to their own professional practice. So uh, a lot that has gone into trying to not, not only what are we delivering, but how are we delivering it. Thanks, Mark. And I just want to end by uh, by noting that we're not uh, just isolating this program here at Sanford. Uh, certainly, we're not isolating it from Sanford. We're, we're looking at all sorts of ways to integrate it with the on-campus experience, the on-campus programs we already have, which is our concentration in our master's program, our fellows program, as well as the executive, uh, executive education program, but also with American Grand Strategy, uh, which is, um, you know, a, a, a campus-wide uh, program that Sanford is very, very involved with. And we imagine there'll be some events, uh, maybe on the weekends, the faculty, the students are here that can coincide with that. Um, and also with the Center for Law, Ethics and National Security at the law school. And so I think that uh, there are many assets at Duke that we, that we want to, to plug into. Um, uh, as a, as a, clo a closing note, I just, um, I just want to say that we're really excited about this new program. Um, we think it'll be a great first step for Sanford into the digital program space, uh, sort of aside from the collective uh, COVID adventure we've all just been on. This will be a, a, a first step for us, and uh, we're excited about it, um, and um, we have you know, a, a new office for digital learning under Mark that we think we, we can handle uh, the, this transition to this new program. And uh, we feel like we're ready for it. Uh, most importantly though, um, I think that we can bring value uh, to the lives of the students who come into the program. That's what we wanna do. You know, we want to bring value to people engaged in the national security sector. Many of them are public servants. And it's our mission as the Sanford School to help educate the leaders of public policy and to address the nation's most pressing challenges. And this program uh, serves to enhance that mission. Um, next year, the Sanford School is going to be celebrating 50 years of public policy at Duke University. And part of the original vision in the letters that went back and forth from Terry Sanford and Joel Fleischman when they were thinking about what this new entity would do was to create a mid-career program. And although though we were started in 1971, it, it took until 1987 before we created our first and so far only mid-career program, which is our master's in international development policy. And we think now is the time you know, for this next step 
uh, for us to create this mid-career program, uh, which we hope will be one of two new programs that we are launching in the, in the near future. Uh, for us, this program directly addresses our one of our strategic priorities, which is to broaden our professional and diversify our professional offerings. And we're really excited to get started and we're happy to take your questions. Thanks to the team from Sanford. Are there any questions? I have one that was submitted to me via email and it's similar to a question that came up in our ECAC discussion. Uh, and the question is, it seems to me after having read the proposal that it's possible to receive the master's degree as being proposed, having taken a minority of the classes uh, from Duke uh, faculty. Is that true? Is that accurate? And if so, is that a good thing? Wow, I think that depends on how one defines Duke faculty. Uh, well, the, que the question that came up in, in ECAT was that you were relying on quite a few adjuncts who will come in course by course, and it may differ from year to year. They may not know one another in any given year. Uh, so. so I think that in the very beginning, as we start up, that may be true as we are, as we're bringing folks on, we may bring them on more in the adjunct capacity for like the first year as we're making sure that they're going to be good teachers and this is going to work out. Certainly, uh, we are planning next year to hire a regular rank, uh, uh, you know, a regular rank Duke professor to help uh, spearhead this. Uh, we imagine Mark will be in, I mean, Tim will be involved in the program and at several of our tenure line faculty have been involved in the program. So what will the actual number of courses taught by folks who are not regular rank faculty be? I think in the beginning, it may be uh, that that's a 50-50 a or maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe a 50-50 balance in the beginning. But then I think as we go into year two and three, um, we'll start to have the majority of classes taught by people whom we define as, as Duke faculty. At the Sanford School, professors of the practice are very much part of our, um, our, our conception of our Duke faculty. Harvey Cohen. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting sounding program. Could you clarify two related things? One, uh, what are the characteristics of the people that you would be looking for to bring into this program, the students I'm, I'm talking Student. about. And related to that, when they finish, what is it you're thinking they will be doing following this program in terms of their career development? Tim, you wanna take this one? I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to answer both of those questions. The first one of the characteristics would be step one, You've spent seven to 10 years in the profession of national security, and that's a broad interpretation. You may work at State Department, you may work at Booz Allen, you may be a serving military member, you may work in an NGO, but what you're doing has something to do with US foreign policy and national security. That's who we're looking for. So this also excludes certain groups of people undergraduate students who have recently graduated or people who are deciding that they want to enter the national security sector, those would not be ideal candidates because there's a baseline and there's an expected level of contribution of the students that we're pursuing based on their work experiences. And what we hope to do when I spoke to the military, when I spoke to the consulting world, and when I spoke to the, the cabinet agencies, this is what they said. This investment is about preparing people for higher levels of contribution, higher levels of responsibility, leadership, or perhaps higher levels of staff quality assistance. So I'm not trying to get, I'm not trying to prepare people to bump to a different job or to leave their agency and get a job in a different agency. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that they will be able to produce higher quality results at their level and at the next higher level within the organizations. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I heard very clearly from one consulting firm was, we will not send somebody to Durham for years because if they do that, they're no longer relevant. But if they can stay, 
in our consulting firm will subsidize their education. And the expectation is they give back for a period of time. So we're going to kind of require them to sign on for a few more years and contribute at a higher level when they finish. So that's our idea. It's not a career change. It's a career investment. The idea that they're going to get a bump for their future contributions. Does that answer your question? Yeah, pretty much. And just one quick uh follow on how many i missed it probably how many are you thinking of starting with the first year we we think that we'll get somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 100 applications and we're look we're really focused on about 20 we think 20 is a good first cohort we'll learn from the cohort they'll learn the dynamics will be good everyone will know each other's names and and the faculty will have time to nurture it and then i think after a year or two we'll reassess if we want to go up you know, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of large programs. I like the small intimate programs, but I think the, the faculty will have to review how it's going and, um, and make adjustments based on what's best for Duke and then ensuring the high quality per student. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Harvey, for that question. Cam Harvey. Yes, thank you uh, for your presentation. I've got one question um, in terms of the offerings. Uh, when I was looking at the alternative offerings, one thing that jumped at me was that American has a course that's devoted to cyber uh, security, whereas cyber plays a minor role, it seems, in the Duke offering. It's grouped into the threats and opportunities amongst about nine different threats. And given that this is increasingly important, uh, I worry that uh, students that want to get something leading edge might not be interested in Duke, which might be viewed as a more traditional, not even giving cyber uh, a full course. Cam, thanks for that question. Also, because I don't know whether you know, but we've actually been making some uh, tremendous investments in cybersecurity over at the Sanford School um, with the hire of David Hoffman, who came to us from Intel. And uh, he is doing fantastic work at the undergraduate level and now also helping lead together with others uh, our concentration uh, in tech policy within the MPP program, which has uh, uh, the ability for students to focus on cyber. Uh, and so uh, it's true that this program is not for folks who, who want to come and become cybersecurity experts exclusively. It is aimed at a different demographic. That doesn't mean that we at the Sanford School don't have the capacity to teach to that or that they couldn't connect with folks in that area or assess program, access programming in that area, but that it's not a dominantly, you know, cyber program. Um, from a curriculum curriculum perspective, Tim, do you want to add anything to that? So uh, the, what I would say uh, in response to that is number one, we have two team uh, classes. And if, if in fact you're right, Cam, that there's a huge demand for cyber, then the projects can be, have a, cy a heavy cyber piece. My issue is that um, cyber may be a sliver that goes deep, but I'm concerned about the broader uh, piece. We are gonna have people from the Intel community. We're gonna have people from the military, none of whom really uh, necessarily have a, a deep cyber understanding. So we're gonna expose it. It's gonna be present in a number of components. And if they choose to go deep on cyber, they have three opportunities to do so. Uh, two in the team learning projects and one in the elective. And for, for where we stand now, not being confident uh, that, that uh, we're gonna have a, a deep, thick cyber vein, I think we've set it up to provide that flexibility without committing ourselves to being a cyber, a, an intense uh, cyber-focused education. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, it does. And the question was mainly um, for the positioning of the program. And you might want to make it very clear in the marketing that you do have deep resources that are available, not just at Stanford, but in other parts of the university um, that your students can draw upon. That's a great recommendation. Thank you. Gary Moffat. Yeah, my question is about the, um, the lack of prereqs and dealing with, you know, for, for students who are 10 years and for some of them maybe longer since they've been in an academic environment. Um, real challenges for some potentially kind of basic academic skills, maybe with writing, uh, especially with math. And I, I can understand why you might want to set up 
um, online courses, but I could also see that students who might be well situated to take advantage of your program might need some longer refreshing of basic algebra even and maybe i'm misunderstanding the the kind of students you're expecting to get but i can imagine that in some lines of work it might have been 10 or 15 years since some of these students did any algebra at all for instance and so how how, how are you thinking about I, I think the timing and whether you students would do some work before they came um, versus doing that when they're here or with a very obviously loaded schedule. Carrie, that's a great point. And, and also one that we have been learning from over the years, uh, as, as Tim can attest to through our counter terrorism fellows program, where we get people who have way more than seven to 10 years of experience. And they've really been away from academia. And believe me, Carrie, sometimes I've had those folks in the class and, and uh, I've told them to write a paper. And they've turned it in and I've said, let me introduce you to the concept of a paragraph. <laughs> and so uh, there's there's definitely a reacculturation for, for some of those folks going back into academia. And we're, we're actually quite familiar with dealing with that. Uh, so Tim, do you wanna just talk to how we're planning to tackle that? Yeah, I mean, Carrie, you strike a nerve with me because I would say the same thing applies to all grad students that aren't coming directly from uh, undergraduate. And so we have uh, in that first summer, we have a number of boot camp type uh, uh, approaches to try to reorient folks to academic writing and to research. We do it now with our counterterrorism fellows. Uh, David Shanzer in the Sanford School does a fantastic job of reorienting people who are working as practitioners to what it means to really research, organize your thoughts, and make a compelling argument. We plan to take part of that and overlay it on this program because we already understand the deficiencies. We have years of these people showing up at Duke uh, having these deficiencies, not because they're not smart, they're very, very smart. It's because their jobs don't demand that type of approach. And so that first summer is gonna be heavily invested to helping them practice and reacquaint themselves to uh, research and writing for a policy community um, with an academic undertone. Does that answer your question, Carrie? It, it, it does, I guess. Um, and, and you all may have plenty of experience and had success doing that, just having a sense for how long that reacculturation and, and baseline might take. I don't know if, if, for instance, there are so many good MOOCs available, you know, if students might you know, have an opportunity to do some of that work prep on their own before they show up so that they're not Kind of overloaded but that's obviously for you all to figure out you know that's a brilliant uh, suggestion we'll take that on board and i know you carrie personally have helped us uh with some of our fellows in the early days of writing and and forming the questions and stuff so i get where you're going bringing practitioners back to the academy always has this problem and uh addressing it early in their time at duke is the right approach and and that has been emphasized by a number of the faculty members thank you Thank you all. That will have to be our last question for the time being. Uh, as I stated earlier, uh, we vote at our next meeting, the May 6th meeting. Uh, you can submit questions in the interim to me via the Academic Council uh, email address, and we'll have time for questions before we vote uh, at, the, at the May meeting. Carrie, thank you for the opportunity to share our program. Thank you, you and your team. Thank you. Now we'll move into executive session for our last agenda item. Uh, if you're not a member of the Duke faculty, I would have to ask you to please excuse yourself from the meeting at this point. Only Duke faculty uh, can remain. Okay, I think we are ready to proceed. Uh, on April 5th, uh, council members uh, for this academic year received an email regarding proposed honor honorary degree candidates. Uh, this email directed you to our Sakai site uh, where we posted bios of the proposed uh, degree recipients. Uh, we asked for feedback and for comments to be sent to us by April the 12th uh, and did not receive any. Uh, today's uh, executive session uh, is made available to allow for questions and discussion at this point about any of the uh, proposed nominees. 
let me also say about uh, this slate, uh, and this is the standard practice. We're not approving, uh, we're discussing, we won't, we'll vote next time, but the vote would not be to approve any particular candidate for honorary degree. We are approving them to be in the pool of candidates that the president may or may not go to at some later date uh, and, and uh, uh, have them at, uh, uh, receive an honorary degree from, from Duke University. Uh, having said that, let me also say, and thank you for keeping this confidential to date, but it has to remain confidential until such time as the president's office makes a announcement. Uh, so we don't want to embarrass anyone that they are in this, this pool, right? It may not ever be selected to receive an honorary degree from Duke, but they're eligible if we approve, they're eligible for three years for the president to, to choose and offer an honorary degree. Uh, Vince, you wanna say anything at this point? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Carrie. Uh, let me just say that the <clears throat> this slate of nominees comes to you from the Honorary Degrees Committee. Uh, that committee has five trustees. Uh, it was chaired this past year by Adam Silver. Uh, other trustees were Lisa Borders, uh, William Brody, Bill Kalin, and Nancy Schlichting. Uh, the committee also has five faculty members, uh, Leslie Curtis, uh, Ellen Davis, uh, Priyas Desai, uh, Peter Fever, and uh, Rick Powell served as faculty members, and then Sally and I uh, sit ex officio on that committee. So it's a process of taking uh, nominations uh, from a variety of sources. The committee also discusses and, uh, and nominates committees uh, or uh, uh, potential uh, candidates on, on its own. And, um, and so I just wanted you to be aware that that was the group that uh, has submitted this particular slate of, uh, of nominees. Thank you, Vince. Are there any questions at this time or comments on this? Again, so the voting will take place via Qualtrics uh, shortly after the election for ECAC has concluded. Uh, members will receive an email and you can cast your vote uh, for, for the nominees at that point. Uh, and then we will announce the results at our May 6th meeting. Any questions about the process? I just see no hearing none. We will stand adjourned. Uh, but before you go, let me remind you that the May 6th meeting is just three weeks away. Uh, and we're meeting at two o'clock uh, to accommodate uh, and to dodge some conflicts. We have trustee meetings that are happening during uh, that that on that day. Uh, and I should also announce that uh, outgoing chair of the Board of Trustees, Jack Bovender, uh, will address the council uh, at the May 6th meeting. So I will see you all then. Stay safe. Get your vaccine if you haven't got it. If you want to talk about it, I'm happy to talk to you about my experience. It was great, smooth. Uh, but please get your vaccination and encourage anybody you see at Duke, on the street, anywhere to get the uh, vaccine. Uh, Thank you. Take care. We'll see you next time.